Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our panel on the Connected Campus. Uh, what all the people have uh, in common on this panel is that they understand policy and also the role of incentives in shaping desired outcomes. All too often when we talk about things like smart cities and campuses, the conversation stays centered on the technology or it focuses on a desired outcome. So the panel here has a lot of expertise in achieving outcomes while thinking about complexity and what are the second and third order effects of our technology decisions. So let me begin by making some introductions. We are joined today by Brandy Nanecki, who is the founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab. She's also a fellow at the Harvard Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Uh, welcome, Brandy. Kira, uh, thank you for joining us. This is Kira Stoll, our UC Berkeley Chief Sustainability Officer and our Carbon Solutions Officer, which I only learned we had when I was putting together the panel. Uh, Scott Seaborn, welcome. Uh, Scott is our Berkeley Campus Privacy Officer. And so I thought our discussion could take a different approach to discussing the Internet of Things and how Berkeley can take advantage of it by starting with our goals and objectives as a public research university. So Kira, uh, let's start with you. And maybe just to begin with, can you tell us a little bit about your role and how the university thinks about sustainability? So um, thank you, uh, Bill, and uh, very happy to be joining this panel um, to, to discuss these issues. Um, so, you know, sustainability has been actually part of the ethos of the Berkeley campus for a very long time. We didn't always call it sustainability, but, you know, there was moves, um, you know, back in the 1960s and the 70s when the environmental movement started taking traction federally um, and California was um, hit with a number of issues around drought and, um, uh, and, and energy um, issues and um, oil embargoes and oil spills. And uh, so, you know, we have actually kind of a long legacy of looking at these issues from energy, transportation and water, but the, um, it really took traction in um, the early 2000s, uh, much in part from students that really wanted the university operations and administration to respond and reflect what we were doing in terms of our mission as a university in academics and research. And from there, a really robust UC system-wide uh, sustainability um, movement happened. We have a policy that has 10 sections in it, guiding what we're supposed to do around um, sustainability across UC. And Berkeley, in almost every case, kind of exceeds um, those policies. So in my role as uh, the chief sustainability officer and looking at carbon solutions for the campus, I'm focused mostly on the campus operations with you know, drawing lines as I can to the academic and the research mission, but really looking at ways that we can be a resource smart um, and a, a conscientious um, environmental um, uh, campus and provide leadership uh, just like we do in the academics. Thank you, Kira. Um, Scott, so let's turn to you. Uh, tell me about the role of the campus privacy officer. What do you do at Berkeley and how much of your job relates to technology and privacy? Thanks, Bill. Thanks for inviting me to participate in the panel. The campus privacy function here at UC Berkeley has a number of different roles. Uh, a lot of it has to do with compliance, so making sure that the campus complies with state and federal privacy laws, uh, in addition to our own UC policies and privacy values. Uh, so we do everything from reviewing policies, reviewing um, data collection practices, uh, monitoring practices to make sure that they're uh, compliant with state and federal law. And also they're not overbearing in terms of how much information is collected. Um, we also work on the transparency report that uh, Bill was instrumental in uh, developing. It's an initiative that involves uh, making public every time we access personal data, personal information. Uh, in terms of this project or these kinds of projects, um, I think our role is really advisory. Uh, we can provide um, different feedback uh, streams or provide different uh, mechanisms for um, reviewing projects uh, to make sure they're not, there isn't too much data collected. We're being transparent about what's collected. If it's shared with other entities, especially external entities, there are some controls that are put in place uh, so we're really kind of, um, let's say, like an advisory organization that uh, makes sure that each of these projects uh, complies with state and federal law and also our Berkeley privacy values. Thank you, Scott. 
So Brandy, uh, can you tell us a bit about Citrus and your role in founding the Citrus Policy Lab? How, and uh, especially I'd like to hear how Citrus approaches navigating a balance between the potential and the risks inherent uh, when new technologies are being adopted. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for hosting this panel. So I am Brandy Nanaki. I direct the Citrus Policy Lab, which is headquartered at UC Berkeley under Citrus and the Banatau Institute, which is actually a four campus institute we're also on the campuses of UC Davis, UC Merced, and UC Santa Cruz. The Citrus Policy Lab supports interdisciplinary tech policy research and engagement with the goal of supporting evidence-based policymaking, not only in the public sector, but also in the private sector, uh, especially because a lot of the governance that's in play on emerging technologies happens within the private sector. Um, so the question you posed about how do we balance, you know, the promise and peril of technology, uh, I think it, it comes from supporting that interdisciplinary research where you connect the individuals who are thinking about the newest, greatest, most innovative technology, and you're going to partner them with people who are thinking about what are the potential benefits and the potential risks of deploying these technologies and what are the appropriate uh, sort of levers that we need to pull to make sure that we are maximizing the development of that technology to support benefit while mitigating those risks. Um, so I encourage people to check out the work of the Citrus Policy Lab at citruspolicylab.org. Um, you can see our, our recent research publications on the website. So Scott, how do you see policy come to life at Berkeley and sort of go from an idea to, you know, Berkeley is not a top-down place. How, how does your role work with that? And, and you know, what are the issues that you see right now with all this organic adoption of technology? That's a great point. Uh, it's definitely not a top-down place. Um, when you're in a compliance role at Berkeley, it can be a little difficult because all these different initiatives and programs develop uh, organically across the campus um, and you don't have as much visibility as you might want to. Um, you also don't know all the key players sometimes, even if you're familiar with uh, leaders and departments, there's different uh, groups that are doing their own thing. So um, a lot of times it's just building awareness of the role of the privacy office, what we do, uh, working with campus partners. We're really lucky that there is a campus uh, privacy group, the Campus Information Security Privacy Committee, CISPC, uh, that has members from different departments across the campus. Um, so they really keep us informed of projects and also work directly with um, you know, principal investigators, uh, different research organizations, uh, different uh, campus departments to uh, build or kind of bake in privacy practices um, as projects are developing. So uh, the European Union, uh, GDPR, I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, uh, General Data Protection Regulation has uh, a concept called privacy by design, where instead of looking at a project or a data collection stream um, after the fact, but while the project's being developed, privacy controls are put in place. So I think that's one of the things we try and do here. And uh, we've been really lucky that uh, a lot of the campus partners are already doing that or, or letting us know if there's a a new data collection or monitoring program um, so we can provide input. I'd actually like to piggyback on Scott's um, comment about CISPC, the Campus Information Security Privacy Committee. Uh, the work that they do, I think, is incredibly valuable and important. And one of the main reasons is because it promotes this diversity of viewpoint. There are individuals on that committee from all of the different departments and colleges and units. There's faculty, there's staff. Um, so I think that that work is really important in any other university tuning in. Uh, I'm certain they probably have similar committees on their campus, but I just want to emphasize that having these types of committees are incredibly important for helping to guide the appropriate procurement, development, implementation, and monitoring of these IoT tools on campuses. That's interesting, and it, it makes it, it raises the question for me, Brandy, of when there's an, a, a technology evolution and there is emerging technology and the implications aren't understood, how do those groups evolve or how do you help us have the right conversation? So when a new thing, a vendor comes in and offers us something, how do we, how do we get, how do we raise awareness of what we're stepping into? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you have to do some scenario thinking. You have to think through what are the potential pitfalls of this technology and bringing together the individ you know, individuals with a diversity of viewpoints are better equipped to be able to think of those edge cases that somebody in one discipline might not think of. Um, so I think really you have to 
do this sort of scenario thinking. Um, they sometimes call it, this is very common in cybersecurity uh, areas of research where you try to map out what are the greatest potential harms that are possible, kind of, you know, figure out what are the known unknowns uh, that you can investigate. In a, in a real life example, Kira, when you are looking at new initiatives, um, and, and there's been a bunch that have come through your program, how, I, I suppose you, scenario planning is sort of what you do also, because on the uh, scoping out of the benefits of new technology, you're looking at things. How, if we're trying to sort of think holistically about how to, to, to deal with the privacy and other issues, what as a key stakeholder leading, you know, the adoption of some of these technologies, how should we make that easy for you, you know, when you're going to kick off a program like Big Belly? And maybe actually you should start by telling people what Big Belly is in case they don't know. Sure. Um, so um, I will uh, say that the Big Bellies are, um, they are exterior waste uh, disposal bins um, that we've put in place on campus. So whoever thought that uh, garbage would be so exciting, but it was a very exciting initiative. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I first want to uh, kind of address the kind of the big picture when we're, when we're looking at um, bringing in a new program or service, um, and then there's a, a data component to it. And oftentimes, you know, we're coming at it from two points. One, we want to kind of embed this into the culture and the operations of what we're doing. So we definitely look at how are people going to be interacting with whatever we're bringing on board? How does it interact with the person? And then because projects like the Big Bellies are so operationally focused, we also have to look at through the operations lens in terms of what do we already know about, you know, something like the waste streams that we have. So using the data that we have to understand how a new tool will fit in. And then also being very careful when we bring new technology on that it's something that we can support and it's something that we can maintain over time. And so then that also gets us into contractual thinking, right? Is this something that we need to manage ourselves and can learn, or is this something that we really want to have as a service uh, along with a new tool? So just using the big bellies as an example, picture a, you know, a, a bin in Sproul Plaza at Berkeley. It's got you know three containers attached with it. It's got solar panels on the top of it. You can put organic materials, recycling, and landfill in. Um, and um, now you're asking the user to make that choice and help us, you know, sort that sort that waste. And um, we were kind of driven to these particular units. Um, probably, I, I wouldn't say the primary reason was the 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 uh, the electronic ability or the, the data ability um, to it, but that it one it was going to help us accomplish our zero waste goals, which are to eliminate landfill on campus by actually offering the public a way to properly dispose of their materials. And that we had this terrible system on campus of these bins that were open, um, critters would get in them. I mean, you know, so we kind of also had a messy campus uh, because of that. And so um, we saw those solutions um, here with this. What we got, and we did contemplate as we put the contracts in place, how long is the service contract for? Who owns the data? Are we going to be able to read the data? How is this? If if this these this this system gives us real time information, are we really going to be able to take advantage of it? If we know a bin is full, do we really even have the staff to go out there and take care of this? And so, um, you know, the long. The long story short is that the decision the campus made to move to these um, have, has had multiple benefits. It, it took us a while, but we've been able to streamline some of the operations. We've been able to kind of reduce pickup services. So there's been a savings in maintenance. We've been able to eliminate materials like bags inside. So saving money and saving uh, resources. Our diversion rate is getting a little bit better. So we're getting a little bit better sorting um, of the materials. And we're also seeing a lot less trash floating around, a lot less pollution in Strawberry Creek. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's overall good how we use what we understand from this new system, I think is still a question out there and an ongoing question for any programs we put in place as can, are we really using what we, this data that we're gathering from these programs um, to our advantage? 
Thank you, Kira. So what data do you collect and how much of it is used to make decisions? We do know what our diversion rates are. So we do understand when we're emptying those bins, how much contamination there might be. So if there's too much contamination in an organics waste stream, we have to send it to the landfill. Um, what we're finding though, is that the contamination levels are particularly low so that we really haven't seen that, um, that issue. Uh, and uh, I think um, we've been able to, like I had mentioned before, streamline some of the operations because we know through this system when the bins are full and when they're not. Um, the other thing that it's, it's, is re we can reveal, these are things we knew anecdotally, but it's become more obvious with this system is that if the surrounding community doesn't have something similar, you know, we have a very porous border. So, you know, materials coming in, you know, from the city, if they're not running a similar system, we're, there's, we're, we're not, we're not able to um, have as positive a result um, if, if there's a, dis, if that's disjointed. I'd like to piggyback on Kira's point earlier um, in regards to who owns the data, who controls the data. Um, it's something I think that comes up a lot. Um, and it sounds like it's come up with this project. Uh, when you're working with a vendor or any sort of outside organization, um, it's really important to put in contract terms that UC Berkeley, whoever is running the program, UC Berkeley in this case, um, has control over that data. So when the program's over, the vendor will return or destroy the data. Um, if there's any disclosures that are necessary to an external party that we have control over that. So I think that's an excellent that uh, Kira's team was thinking about that when working uh, with vendors and putting that language in the contracts. So you, it sounds almost like you're referring to the famous or infamous Appendix DS, um, <laughs> this data security attachment to all the procurement. And I wonder what you do when a technology works in a way that's sort of incompatible with say the way that document was written now several years ago, um, what where do you get pulled in and what do those conversations look like? Yeah, there, there's been a few situations um, this past year when the language in Appendix DS doesn't really uh, work. So you have situations where Appendix DS is really written sometimes, or you can think of it as uh, written for a data set that is in one fixed location um, there aren't multiple users accessing it from various points. Um, so a lot of times we will add in language uh, in regards to putting access controls in uh, to systems using the data. There's portals making sure that they're also secure, um, and really making sure that the vendor passes on any of their security requirements to other parties. Because um, in many cases, it's not just the vendor that has access. They can't even control sometimes who has access to the data. So, yeah, that's, that's very important. And sometimes we can do it, and sometimes we have to escalate that process uh, up to the campus leadership. So um, thank you, Scott. Brandy, um, so you think about this a lot uh, in your academic work and at a very high level. I, I know you've done work with the World Economic Forum, for example, advising them on their AI uh, procurement in a box. It seems that's very relevant to the discussion here. And you know, what do we do when a vendor says, sorry, Scott, uh, we're not accepting your terms and conditions. We have we think of ourselves as a large institution, but uh, is there a bigger opportunity for us? And how can Berkeley play into that? Yeah, thank you for bringing up procurement. That is, I think, one of the strongest uh, levers we have on influencing how these technologies will operate on our campus. And I think, you know, unfortunately, if the vendor says we can't comply, then we say, oh, well, unfortunately, we can't work with you. Um, the UC system, if you think of it in its entirety of all 10 campuses, this is a, a huge uh, sector for them to, to work in. And so if we set standards, I, I think that it would compel them to follow in order to be able to access our campuses. I also want to touch on, on data and thinking about that in the procurement guidelines, um, especially you know when Scott was bringing up privacy by design principles. Um, also, I'd like to talk about data minimization uh, as a part of a privacy by design principle that ensuring these entities are only collecting the data that is necessary for them to perform the function that they're intending to uh, implement and that they're clear that only the data they need is the data they collect. Um, and I, I think also there's an important consideration about data sharing, uh, data ownership, 
is data being shared with any additional third parties? Does the campus have ownership of that data? Um, you know, how does the vendor gain access to that data to improve its models and processes in those agreements that are put in place? So yeah, I think procurement is one of the most important levers. And I would recommend individuals check out the World Economic Forum's procurement in a box guidelines. They're extremely helpful. They are targeted toward government entities uh, procuring AI technologies, but the recommendations, the, the guides, the you know, they even come up with questions to help individuals who are procuring the technology, questions that you should be asking vendors. They have a whole list. It's extremely helpful and I think very relevant to campuses also looking to implement uh, emerging technologies. Well, I, you know, if I just might add to that, it's very interesting because in the procurement area, um, oftentimes when I'm looking at something, I'm looking at how transparent we can be with the data or how much we can make that data available to the public so that they can interact with it um, as well. And so I think um, that that line between, you know, what's private and being collected, um, the privacy piece, and then what we want to share out, um, you know, you know, to to make change um, and transformation is really important. So, you know, we've been, you know, I've been on project where we've been installing solar panels, they're third party owned and operated, but we wanted to make sure that the real time data was available to the public if they wanted to see um, how those panels were performing. Um, uh, and then I think the other piece I'd add to the data and the procurement piece is that also working with our vendors so that they can help us collect um, in, a, in a sane way, the data we need to understand how things are performing. Because oftentimes there's, maybe like too much data, or there's a, a particular one, two or three items we really need to understand and having the vendor working with us um, on those data pieces. So maybe this is a question, go ahead, Brandy. Yeah, I was gonna piggyback up on that. And I think um, you raise a really good point here about maybe they're collecting too much data. There's like this data overload. And at some point it's just too much. You can't gain anything meaningful from it. Um, and I think that that is an important consideration that, you know, just because you can implement a technology or just because you can collect the data doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Um, so I think this also ties back to our earlier discussion about these privacy committees. Uh, I think that those committees are really well positioned to help consider uh, in obviously in partnership with the entities on campus that are implementing these technologies who actually know the data that they need, but to ask those tough questions about do you really need to collect that data in order for you to streamline your process to achieve X, Y, and Z objectives? And that, and that actually raises another question, and I'm not sure this may be for everybody on the group, is do we collect the data is, is a question. And I guess another question with technology is do we even want a technology solution for something in this space. And so asking that question of things rather than um, than sometimes adopting the technology, which maybe we're seeking for one scenario, but it actually contains a lot of other aspects within it. Um, you know, how should the university think about that when it comes to a smart campus uh, and the idea of uh, what we're calling a connected campus? Because we're again trying to shape that, um, our purpose around it. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, good question. And sometimes there's a conflict between the idea that this technology exists and we might as well use it. Um, and then the practical side of things, maybe there's a better way to do this, the old fashioned way or the old school way. Um, thinking about the COVID-19 situation and some of the uh, projects or initiatives that have been raised to keep track of who's on campus and what buildings they're in. Um, uh, some of the proposals that come up are really exciting in terms of using Wi-Fi data uh, to determine who's in campus buildings and things like that. But um, sometimes just having someone uh, campus monitor, <laughs> keeping track of the numbers of people in the building uh, in some ways is easier. So that's just one example where the technology solution isn't always the best solution, or in this case, it actually might be, but um, you know, there's something to think, think about uh, from a privacy standpoint. In most cases, the analog solution is, is better. <laughs> so um, you know, sometimes you collect too much data, you may be collecting data uh, as Brandy pointed out, that you don't need, you want to minimize it. And when you have that extra data sitting around, there's uh, that much more chance that it'll be shared inappropriately or disclosed inappropriately. In the beginning part of the conversation, uh, Brandy, you talked about um, 
the CISPC committee and how it included a lot of different voices. And so we're able to see different aspects of a problem and sort of engage in it. I, I'm thinking about how do we think about inclusivity as a whole in, in the technology choices and how they shape our, our physical architecture on the campus as well as our IT architecture. And um, when we're purchasing things, do they affect the inclusivity of our campus? Wow, what a good question, Bill. Yes, I think so. I think all technology uh, inherently has, you know, inclusivity barriers and opportunities. And so when we're thinking about those technologies and evaluating whether or not we should procure them, we should try to come to that decision by including the diversity of viewpoints and diversity of abilities that people have who interact on our campus. I'll just give one example. It's not a really smart um, IOT device, but even, you know, um, hand soap dispensers or um, like Purell <laughs> dispensers, sometimes those sensors won't recognize darker skin tones. That's obviously not something that, that we want. And I think while the, this is one small example, that can be scaled to other types of technologies that are in use that may disproportionately not work on certain um, individuals. So we have to think about whether or not these technologies are fit for purpose for all, uh, all of our campus community. In the life cycle of, say, with Cura, working on sustainability, how do we make sure that we inject the right conversations and considerations and make that easy? Um, I guess, and you could hear from all of you, including Cura, on like, you know, these, these are hard initiatives to do. It's hard to figure out even sometimes who all the stakeholders are. How do we, um, what can we do to have the right conversations around the technology decisions with something like this when it might not even be viewed as a technology decision? It's a great question. And, um, you know, thinking about it just from the procurement lens um, and the sustainability aspect of it, um, the U University of California system now has a uh, policy, sustainability policy that says if you're going out for a request for proposal um, of a th certain threshold that 15% of your evaluation cr criteria needs to be based on sustainability and that can be environmental, social, um, or economic sustainability. And so there's already, there's this new lever that's been built into um, our procurement process. And um, I've just gone through an RFP process myself, and it was very interesting to look at the sustainability criteria opportunity, which is so open and it could be a diverse supplier to, you know, they've built their headquarters that it's a green building, um, you know, that they report transparently. It's, it's very broad right now. So there could be a real opportunity here to talk about because so much so much of what we're procuring today has some sort of technological piece to it, to start defining what, is, what does inclusion mean, even if it, it through a sustainability lens. Yeah, just really quick drawing upon the work um, that the World Economic Forum has put forward. I think, yeah, it's Kira pointed out, it's especially if you have projects over a certain threshold where you can implement some of these requirements. And I think that she brought up an excellent point about defining inclusion across different areas, uh, racial, you know, um, gender, age, all the different types of inclusivity. And then thinking through, it may be in partnership with a committee like CISPC, I'm not sure if that's the relevant committee that should do this, but coming up with a set of questions that helps the individuals who are procuring the technology to ask so that they're questioning whether or not that technology is likely to be inclusive of those various categories is, I think, a huge help for uh, procurement. Scott? I think that's a great idea. Um, and kind of piggybacking off that, um, the other thing that uh, we're trying to do more of is to solicit feedback from uh, users who will have the experience or whose data will be collected especially uh, underrepresented users who maybe uh, haven't had the chance to provide feedback in the past. Um, so I think that's something that we're working on. We're trying to engage student groups uh, at the CISPC. We have two students on the CISPC, but we're trying to do a better job of working with uh, various student populations uh, to make sure that their voices are heard and um, if there's any sort of potential bias, for example, uh, that we can address that. So I, this actually raises another question for me, which is, if we're putting a lens on the connected campus and sort of internet of things type applications, um, how, how should we think about establishing a toolkit for that 
and 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 how do we interleave these existing policies into something like that? Does it is it even the right way of drawing the boundary around thinking about something, or you know, or is Internet of Things a component of these other policies? Like you could kind of look at it from different angles. And what's in your experience and, and research? What's the how? What's the most effective way to approach that kind of thing? I don't have a response exactly directly to that, but one of the you know things to kind of point out and be able to kind of weave the connections in there is that we have some really urgent issues that we need to address, and that I think this Internet of Things and this connected campus concept, um, if we could sort through some of the issues or the challenges with it, is going to be so instrumental for us making being able to make really rapid positive shifts. I mean, you know, we have budget constraints right now, a pandemic, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis. We have so many things um, that, and it's so um, kind of difficult sometimes to get messaging out or, or understand how we can bring people together and get, you know, opinions um, that, we can really use this connected campus um, idea to really help us make, make decisions. Um, and so it seems like there's so many great pieces that we have right now. There just needs to be, we need to make some kind of strong, stronger connections to help us do that more quickly. Um, any, any final thoughts from, from people before we uh, wrap up? Brandy, maybe a last word? I was just going to add that yeah, I think Kira is spot on. I think that there's this great opportunity for lesson sharing across entities on the UC Berkeley campus that are implementing these technologies, sort of the best practices where they've seen, you know, also where things didn't work out um, and sharing those best practices in a type of toolkit. I'm a, I'm a big proponent for toolkit. I think that they're very helpful. If not the end all, they're a really good starting point, I think for organizations to be able to you know, ramp up projects. So I just wanted to say, I think that that's an excellent idea. Well, thank you all. And, and that was actually a great note to end the panel on because this is sort of the end of the conference and our theme of innovation in the time of coronavirus. So innovation is gonna happen whether or not we apply any management to it, even as difficult as the times are. So I'm glad that you all convened to help us think about how to do things uh, so we could do less with less and still keep everything running and keep Berkeley what it is, uh, what it is. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.